Good afternoon and welcome to today's session, The Future of Fintech. I can see participants are joining us, um, so very welcome to you all. Um, this week is uh, Fintech Week, so we thought um, a great time to bring together some speakers for you. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Sue McLean. I'm a partner in the tech group at Becky McKenzie and uh, trustee and vice chair at the SCL. Um, as I say, this, this week is UK FinTech Week. It's been an exciting week here. We've seen the UK government announce that it intends to be the global hub for crypto. We've heard the FCA talk about how innovation is the golden thread running through their policies. We've even had the chancellor arguably jump on the hype wagon and uh, share his plans to have the Royal Mint issue an NFT. So lots going on. Um, I'm excited to hear what our speakers are seeing in the fintech sector and where it's headed. We're going to look at some of the challenges fintechs, you know, fintech raises for policymakers, the rule of law and how we reconcile all of this and how to navigate this very fast moving regulatory landscape we're seeing around all aspects of fintech at the moment. But today, um, I'm very delighted that one of our SEL Women in Tech Law Working Group members, Despina, uh, Hatsa Manoli is actually going to moderate the session today. Uh, Despina is a senior legal expert and team leader of regulatory policy, advice team number two of the legal and compliance unit at the European Banking Authority, the EBA. But we're also delighted to be joined by Alex Alexander, who is general counsel at Liberis, a fintech which really is focusing on one of the, the hottest trends of fintech at the moment, embedded finance. Uh, we also have uh, Ruta Merka uh, via Shuti, who is the head of digital finance at the EBA, and it's a real coup for us because Ruta told me earlier this is her first uh, panel event as uh, the head of digital finance at the EBA, so lucky for us at SCL to have her here today. Um, and last but certainly not least is one of my colleagues, Sarah Williams, who's a senior associate in our financial services regulatory practice here at Baker's. She advises both traditional financial institutions and fintech clients with a particular focus on new and innovative business models. So I am not gonna waste any more time and I'm gonna hand right over to you Despina to take us away on this really interesting area uh, of law. Thank you. Thank you very much Sue um, uh, for, for this introduction and thank you for pronouncing our names, uh, both, both mine and Ruta's uh, <laughs> excellently. Thank you for this. Um, I have to start by saying it's a pleasure and an honor to be chairing this event on behalf of the Women in Tech Law subcommittee. And so as a hostess of this event, co-hostess with you, I would like to uh, uh, repeat my thanks um, to uh, the, the, the colleagues who have agreed to join us uh, today. Um, and uh, with just a small wording for my bad cold uh, and apologies in advance for that, I'll just... Um, launch into our discussion and and of course as a as a host uh, I'm, I'm supposed to introduce the topic um, uh, of the discussion and kind of uh, structure our discussion a bit so um, I'm, I am sure that uh, many of you have already been to many other events and have read um, a lot extensively about fintech and um, uh, there are different ways to approach it and different definitions uh, let's say relating to it um, and I was thinking that one of the two, two of the main elements that all of these definitions have in common are, of course, the uh, financial innovation, which is based on technology. But this on its own doesn't really say much because I was thinking, uh, I mean, even in, in, in Florence, uh, uh, the first bankers ever who had their ledger, that was also a kind of technology. So uh, it's different kinds of technologies, the use of modern technology, but the, the second uh, kind of um, uh, 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 biggest element in the discussion of FinTech uh, today is the extent, the sweeping extent to which uh, that use of technology has affected and has materially changed uh, uh, the, the business models, the activities, um, uh, uh, the services provided, and of course the regulation as well. And, and, and over the, the time in recent years, there have been many who have devised kind of uh, heuristic approaches like schemes uh, to consider 
um, fintech and how to look at it. Uh, we were discussing with Sue that she often speaks of umbrella. There are different ways of, of approaching it, but one that I found to be useful and one which is known in the kind of regulatory uh, circles a bit more is, is the one that I'm going to share with you now on screen. If you give me one second. Um, uh, is, is that of the Financial Stability Institute, um, FSI, and this is the, the so-called uh, fintech tree. And, and the reason that uh, I've, I, I like this is because um, I'll talk you through it for a minute or so. Uh, the reason that I like this is, is the following, because you can, I mean, uh, starting from the visible parts of the tree, you can see that the trunk in the middle are the actual technologies that enabling some of the uh, innovation. Um, then the main branches on the upper part of the tree are referring to kind of more classical, let's say concepts in, uh, in banking and financial regulation. So um, areas of uh, deposit and lending or capital raising asset management, which would be securities, let's say area, there is insure tech, there are some infrastructural, infrastructural, let's say, related uh, topics. Uh, so clearing, settlement, the payments uh, systems. And then um, let's say that the foliage of the tree are um, uh, the new and emerging ways in which FinTech is appearing. So in the deposit and lending area, we have FinTech, as they call it, FinTech, FinTech balance sheet lending, which can be uh, covering from crowdfunding to non-bank lending, and we'll speak about that later, um, or to digital banking, so our virtual banks, um, and in capital raising, the equity crowdfunding uh, a bit, or for asset management, the robo-advice, or different ways in which insurance uh, services can be, uh, can be provided. And I won't speak much about them because I'm not a super expert on this. Um, uh, but but so you can see that this this kind of puts a, a, a good uh, um, uh, concept together to, to understand start understanding fintech. Now, if you move to the roots of the tree, as you can see, the FSI colleagues have called these policy enablers because, in a way, these are these are bits that um, the legislation has uh, put in place. These are tools to uh, they, they relate around the uh, technology uh, instruments uh, and they are uh, the main enablers for allowing the fintech tree to flourish if i want to continue the the metaphor there so um with with uh, that in mind and seeing that today we're having in our panel uh, representatives, colleagues from uh, um, a fintech, a law firm advising fintechs and traditional uh, financial institutions and a regulator, um, I thought that perhaps we could uh, uh, try to see their uh, different point of, points of view. And, and since um, uh, fintech is, uh, fintechs are the main innovators, so uh, we are working around them, I, I thought that I would start with um, uh, with the question, let me stop sharing my screen. I would start with a question to Alexis, if I can, um, and invite her to kind of explain to us where uh, Liberis um, is, is, stands in, in this kind of general panorama that uh, I described a minute ago. And then um, speak to us, I mean, I guess um, the, um, uh, I, I was uh, I, I was interested to hear about the opportunities you see as a fintech, but I guess this this comes together with describing what you do as as as, a, as an organization, uh, and then maybe you can talk us through also some of the uh, challenges and issues that you have uh, started to uh, to see. Sure. Thank you. Um, hi everyone. Um, so Liberis is an embedded finance pr uh, provider, as just been a uh, rightly uh, said at the start. It might have been Sue. Um, and what that means is we are really capturing the opportunity to leverage data and technology to actually enable um, SMEs who are often the most underserved and yet represent the highest proportion of the, of, of the economy um, to access finance. And access to finance is a real problem. Um, it is inevitably discriminatory. Um, for, for And I know that's quite a uh, that's probably um, quite an alarmist word to use to a degree, but but actually the traditional ways of lending and underwriting um, involve 
um, assessments, credit assessments that just don't work for some of the um, new types of businesses that are coming to market. So we serve exactly that type of, of community of SMEs. So the sorts of SMEs that either have a very sort of cyclical uh, way of getting takings, um, often there's a kind of high proportion of um, minorities that we, that we serve, a lot of sole traders, a lot of the kind of businesses that have really struggled during the pandemic and would not be able to get access to funding from traditional lenders. And so what you see is this huge opportunity to serve all of those SMEs uh, due to leveraging and honing data points and technology. So we provide embedded finance by way of um, essentially an API that offers the back end and the balance sheet to strategic partners, um, one of our largest being WorldPay, for example, who will then offer a white labeled version of our solution. So WorldPay Business Finance powered by Liberis to their SME customers. And they naturally have a captive audience um, and all of those customers kind of feel like they're on their own existing journey with WorldPay, but can access funding as part of it. And the great thing is we are able to access through deep data integrations and technological relationships with the likes of WorldPay or, or other partners, um, their card transaction data. And so that offers a whole new data point to allow us to underwrite in a way that a bank wouldn't be able to. It's not looking at credit profiles and credit history alone, right? So great, great opportunities, even greater since the pandemic, which has massively enhanced the digital opportunities out there. Um, everyone's gone digital. So embedded finance was a thing before, it's a massive thing now. Um, but what are the difficulties? The difficulties are that that tree is a perfect example because you look at it and you look at these really great foliage bits you referred to just now. The problem is the foliage is at the top. So regulation is right at the bottom. So if the roots are kind of uh, unable to support the foliage, there's no foliage, it's not gonna grow. Um, and so that's, that is ultimately the problem. Now, I think there is, an, there is an issue with regulation catching up with the speed at which FinTechs are innovating. And that's sort of inevitable to a degree. Um, but I actually think there's an opportunity for regulators, and I know we've got return on, of course, I'm really keen to see what, what you have to say, but uh, to have regulators really consult with business stakeholders in these fintechs. Because a lot of the time, the I actually think the businesses and the regulators kind of want the same thing. So in our, for us, for example, it's to massively enhance access to finance. I think everyone wants the SME community. There's a you know one trillion funding gap in the SME community. We all want these businesses to be able to access finance. The difficulty is, and it's the devil is in detail, really. These regulations kind of come about, but they're sort of not fit for purpose because practically none of these fintechs can implement them. So, um, so I think for me, it's that kind of, it's that sort of balancing act of speed to market innovation, helping the underserved communities access to finance with proportionate regulation, workable regulation, practical regulation. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, for me, that's the inevitable tension. Um, and, and, you know, I, I, I really would love to hear from the rest of the panel who know a lot more than me about this. But, you know, one example for us is we, um, our product is business cash advance. It's a form of receivables finance. In some European markets, it's regulated. In others, it isn't. Um, it sort of does fall into the lending regime in some. It doesn't in others. And I think, you know, Sarah and others I know will agree that credit and lending is a European regulatory regime that is incredibly difficult. So innovative lenders who want to enable access to finance have huge barriers because the European credit regime is, is pretty impossible to navigate, if I'm honest. Um, but yeah, I will, I will stop talking now, but um, that's, my, that's my two pence. Thank you, you raised, thank you, Alexis, you raised some uh, very important issues that I'm, I'm sure Ruta will pick up uh, shortly. Um, but I thought before we go to Ruta, I thought because um, Sarah represents uh, the other segments uh, of, of, the, of, the, uh, of the market that follows closely uh, fintech. So they, the advisors, they are together with either you're, you're on the market or on the foliage uh, itself. Um, and so I was, I was thinking I could get also a view from Sarah's point of view on, on as, as, as legal advisors and um, what are 
the main um, opportunities and issues that you also see from your point of view and perhaps you are also in a position to see a bit more um, the trends uh, evolving in this sector because uh, you advise on different um, on a variety of, of, of clients so uh, maybe uh, you can also give us your view around this yeah absolutely and hi everyone um you know one thing I was going to say first is I'm going to preface what I say today with that the FCA actually put out their business plan for 2022-23 uh, this morning. Uh, so I had a quick read of it and actually a lot of the themes that they're talking about are pretty familiar and they're things that we all know about. But um, let's hopefully, hopefully not. But what I say today may no longer be the trends in uh, <laughs> six months time when they've, they've completely changed their processes. But, you know, I think that a lot of the themes that Alexis you were talking about are definitely replicated across the market you know you you brought out those issues in lending but it, that's not the only place where people really struggle to pinpoint exactly where their business model fits with regulation and so how do they sort of grow across markets not just in the EU but obviously globally when you're trying to sort of fit your different business fit your model into different regulatory regimes and trying to sort of navigate those different processes and so that that's something that we we definitely see as an issue for fintech globally and, and you know across the eu um you know i think in terms of the trends we see historically uh, if you can use that term in the fintech world but historically i think fintech has been quite focused on payments and credit then more recently, we've seen a real rise in you know, retail stock broking, uh, moving into the investments market, opening up that access to investments for retail customers. And those sorts of offerings have continued to grow. And I think in the UK market have become very, very cemented. And so I think one thing we're seeing in the regulatory space is that some of the success of particularly the payments firms, which I think were the kind of earliest fintechs that we saw becoming very popular, their success has led to quite a lot of regulatory focus. Um, I think with people realizing that some of these fintech firms, which were initially startups and innovative and exciting, actually have become very, very important to the ecosystem. And I, particularly following Wirecard, I think there's a real um, understanding that some, uh, some fintechs now are actually getting into that almost too big to fail category because they're so interconnected with other providers. And so um, one of the interesting things I think we've seen is that as fintech matures, the regulation of fintech has also matured we're moving slightly past the focus on just consumer protection which is obviously still very important but moving into more prudential focus actually so you know the fca is very focused on wind down plans they're very focused on protection of funds do you have adequate financial assets you know how do you make sure that if there's a disruption that you can adequately deal with that and then um, looking at interconnectedness in the system, you know, where you're using agency models, if it's a tied agent regime uh, that we call the appointed representative regime in the UK, how many people are relying on your license that if you fail, they fail. So that, that's been a really interesting, I think, maturing of the sector. Um, and actually, you know, bringing in new insolvency regimes, replicating what we do for investment firms and banks in the, in the payments world. I think, you know, in terms of other trends, I don't think you can talk about fintech trends without talking about crypto. Um, I think most businesses are talking about it, even if they're not trying to get into that space, it's definitely on their radar. And a lot of fintech firms are either established firms looking to launch a crypto product. Um, you know, we're seeing people who actually just face crypto firms, you know, payment providers who have to, who are processing payments with crypto firms and they need to understand the regime or new providers who sort of want to get into that space. And I think a bit like lending, it's currently a very difficult space to navigate. There's obviously a lot of flux in the rules, a lot of uncertainty about where the rules might be going, um, you know, trying to navigate that unharmonized regime as you grow your business. I think even across the EU, where a lot of our clients are actually used to harmonization, particularly if they come from a payments or investments background, they're quite surprised to find that the same doesn't exist. And actually, in some places, you might need a license in others you don't need anything maybe you need to register for money laundering but it's it's quite sort of diff difficult there and i think you know a lot of people are quite cautiously optimistic about the my car regulation and how that might help them grow their business whilst balancing that sort of i think alexis as you were saying proportionate and practical regulation with having something that they can really fix themselves to and and comply and, and grow and so that's been quite interesting i think at the eu level and it's sort of one of those post Brexit issues that the UK finds itself outside of the, you know, out in the cold on, on that growth sector. And so 
we've got quite a different messaging around crypto. Um, you know, Sue mentioned the government has launched that we're going to be a, a global hub for, for crypto asset technology, which is, which is great, but it's sort of slightly at odds with what we're seeing. And so I think crypto firms are grappling with the idea that we're going to be a crypto asset hub, but you also can't get registered and you're being rejected and it's taking 12 months to get a license. And so in the UK, I think the trend is very much just trying to get on an even keel between what the rhetoric is versus what the reality is of, of crypto businesses. Um, I think another interesting trend in crypto, and this kind of goes to the maturing market point, is the shift from retail to institutional focus. Uh, you know, fintechs often viewed through quite a consumer lens, and I think regulatory priorities have often been focused on that naturally as well. And I think, you know, we're seeing a lot of institutional use of fintech and crypto. Uh, you know, in the last six months, the number of questions I've had on institutional crypto issues has, has really, really grown. And the PRA, and the FCA are focusing on that. And so I think we're going to see more of that as larger institutions sort of get into that space, which is pretty, pretty exciting and interesting. And um, I finally, I think, you know, I don't think you can have a session in 2022 without talking about ESG um, and operational resilience. And those are topics that are not going to go anywhere. For anyone who was at the Innovate Finance Global Summit this year, ESG was a huge focus. Um, I think with the maturing of the fintech industry, ESG becomes more and more of a priority and operational resilience, again, becomes more important because you're such an important sector. So I would say that those are the sort of main, main themes that I've been seeing and trends that we, we sort of see in the market and some of the issues that people deal with. Thank you very much, Sarah. I think uh, we, we've already, I mean, we, we knew that when we started out with, the, with this event that we wanted to take a generic approach rather than focus on specific products or technologies or financial sectors. Um, uh, so uh, already with, with your two contributions, I think we've put already on the table for Ruta to comment. Um, but my, my suggestion would be that maybe Ruta, you can give us um, an overview of, of uh, some of the regulatory uh, priorities uh, from your point of view, the European point of view, mostly, obviously, but um, I would say that perhaps some of the specific issues that uh, the colleagues raised, we can pick them up in uh, subsequent questions, like on the specific um, uh, balance between uh, efficiency and um, uh, prudential safety or financial stability, etc. But maybe you can give us an overview of um, also your. I mean, you're you're new to your new role, um, uh, but perhaps you can give us an overview for for listeners uh, of uh, what is being planned, a kind of in reaction to the issues that uh, Sarah and Alexis raised. So firstly, hello everyone. It's a great opportunity for me. Like I said, it's my first event as a head of uh, digital finance unit at the ABA. So I am happy firstly that it's a woman panel and dedicated for a woman. And another part is about what we are talking about the future and future in tech. So as this minute said, I might be new at my role, but I'm not new at the topic. So uh, uh, that said, so let's start with the regulation and I will try to cover both your uh, question Despina and both what I heard uh, because I, I really maybe I went to start with the regulation that Alexa said that okay regulation is always late and it's inevitable and I guess it's uh, if we understand that regulation is not the is late and it's inevitable I guess we can take it as a normal principle because it's always happening like, so you cannot introduce a regulation uh, before something happens, some new model applies. It's the way European Union uh, democratic countries used to used to uh, used to work. It will work. So I guess understanding sometimes the constraints, we could use that for our benefit in a way that uh, uh, a regulation could flourish some innovations. So starting with that, uh, I will. Uh, just talk about some topics that are on the agenda, on EU European agenda. So digital finance itself, it's uh, uh, on the agenda of European Commission. Uh, they just issued recently a call for advice uh, last year um, on the new technologies, on the new trends, what we see. And that Alexis presented, the embedded standards, it's one of the trends what we 
saw and we responded this year that more and more um, banks and also other companies that uh, facilitated by third party providers and then I reflect third party providers this mean anyone it's not only uh, I'm talking about open banking or open payments uh, but anyway uh, and for a user perspective I sometimes see only you know a platform an app but I don't know what's underneath it might be like 10 or 20 uh, um, institutions that are licensed or unlicensed in a way for me it's very comfortable because I can get a product in a nutshell it could be you know investments uh, for SMEs it could be you know uh, some uh, lending opportunities uh, for others but as a regulator as a financial uh, supervisor you're always seeing so what is the risk and I guess the regulation or supervision is always uh, thinking firstly about risk then our opportunities of course we need to, to get a balance so what we uh, envision that th there are new models uh, more or less that is um, for example crowdfunding, uh, uh, crypto custody, and then new ways of delivering it, like you uh, said embedded finance, so in payments, especially it's a possibility then you have a license and someone else create you a front end and just different uh, companies, they use it. In a way, the startup companies, they might be, you know, uh, really save on compliant costs, but on the other hand, that Sarah mentioned, then, then you are got dependent on the uh, financial institution and it might be failed one day, yeah. So these are interconnections, but we also investigate down a report uh, and a, a report uh, response to the digital finance from the way that banks and financial institutions are getting dependent on the third party providers. But another part that Sarah mentions is also very important. On the topics that are more relevant to the regulation, and then I say regulation, it's about you know proposals for regulations. So we have uh, two abbreviations, it's Mika and Dora, and I'm not talking Dora for te television, some animation series uh, <laughs> pers personage, but Dora is more for Operational Resilience Act, and Mika is not for the singer, but it's also an act for, uh, for a crypto asset uh, market. So what they really captures is something, um, you know, the, the regulation that it has seen, you know, we, you can see Mika, it's a crypto asset, like five, six years ago, we already saw that something coming, but regulation, like, like I said, it's a bit late, but sometimes it's late purposelessly because you can not just, you know, have some implication of the crypto and just regulate. Maybe there is no bigger risk to let us unregulate and, and that's the question on non-banking lending why they it's so fragmented uh, because Alexis said I, I really like Alexis that regulation is you know something that uh, birds them and you cannot um, work on but sometimes regulation that you say that is fragmentation in the EU market you are striking for regulation because it creates a level playing field so there is a balance like uh, for non-banking lending we are now working on report uh, on non-banking lending and what we see it's a fragmentation of different uh, regimes national regimes and that really creates a lot of burden but on the other side it's unregulated so then it's unregulated maybe there's no burden but when they reach uh, uh, this phase then a company wants to provide services within the Europe it's better to have this regulation and and create this let the playing field the rules that all knows that is possible and also to reflect to the lending itself and the for SMEs sometimes they cannot access the finance. I guess it's very important to understand SMEs the way of cycle, how they get it funded. And each way then you are just a um, startup, then you are more mature, you might need a different uh, ways of uh, financiation. So I start you know, with free F, it's full friends and uh, your funds. Then you go to the crowdfunding, then maybe other non-banking lending, then bank, are coming in than capital markets. So I think that in different phases of the 
of the finance that you need the different uh, players. So it's uh, very good that embedded finance itself has a finds a way to have to to fill this gap, uh, fill this gap. Then the, the banks cannot because the the banks are usually funding only then the SMEs are. Uh, are more mature, one, three years or something more. Then you are like seed stage. So what kind of funding you can get? Only maybe some innovative. So it's a very complex thing. There is no like uh, black and white. I say, I think that uh, there is an ecosystem that could be uh, workable on. What I also uh, reflect uh, to Sarah, and it's very important that she thought about this uh, crypto and yes uh, mica and regulation in the european union the proposals on mica is addressing crypto crypto assets and that is the very interesting phase and the shift in regulation because like now it's unregulated now we have a lot of warnings even uh, we as uh, european banking authority together with esma and eiopa we issued a warning to the Customers that they have to uh, look to the attention, consumers to attention by investing in crypto assets because it's too volatile and regulated. And for retail customers, it's not really uh, a good mean for investment. But at the same time, like in two and three years, this kind of uh, commodity will be regulated at the European uh, level. So we are living in very like shift uh, in a change and i would say in a in a fintech change is inevitable it's like change is a constant uh, normal and that's what we have to think about so just summarizing what i said um, yes uh, regulation is something that's late so we just have to uh, take it as a you know as a norm and get the benefit one way then you have unregulated um area it's very good for the first initiatives for first uh, innovation but then there are more innovation and more players the regulation sh should come in and and have this kind of uh, balance approach that i really uh, agree on uh, th thank you, Ruta. I, I mean, I, I was, uh, it, it was in uh, my plan to now ask for some of the colleagues' uh, reactions to, to what you said. Um, but in order to make it a bit more structured reaction, I, I thought maybe I'm, I can invite you to opine also a bit on, I mean, I picked two of the themes that all of you raised. One, of course, is uh, that regulation needs to have flexibility, but on the other hand, you also need uh, harmonization. And, and sometimes these can be difficult to achieve. Um, so maybe I can invite a bit, uh, Sarah and Alexis, your thoughts about uh, what could be done. I mean, there is a, uh, a tendency. I mean, these are um, regulatory uh, questions that pop up in any regulatory setting, but they are even more pressing in the context of FinTech. Um, so what if, Perhaps in the UK, there is a suggestion and implied uh, direction for a more light touch approach. But uh, how can that light touch approach can be easily reconciled uh, with uh, harmonizing and giving the legal certainty that uh, some of the fintechs are? So I'm, I'm reflecting a bit also with Ruta, what you said about, uh, you know, the balance. It's a balancing act and we're trying to find it all together. Uh, but maybe invite some thoughts and reactions from Sarah and Alexis. I mean, I think um, I really like what Ruta said, which is actually uh, there's a perception that the fintechs are afraid of regulation. Actually, we're not afraid of regulation. We were, you know, I would love a situation where there was clear regulation where we could get regulated and offer the product around Europe. I think globalization requires regulation. The, the difficulty is, um, and actually it brings credibility to a lot of, um, and comfort to a lot of new products in the industry. So I don't actually think there's a, um, I think there's less fear amongst fintechs than one, one would think. The issue is the harmonization point, as you um, as you alluded to, Despina, uh, uh, because, you know, I know that we're not alone. So I, I, I speak to a number of peers in our space in, in lending, embedded finance, um, and 
you know, we're all struggling with the same thing. We want to globalize. We want to serve these SMEs. And actually, the perception is these SMEs only want to go and get crowdfunding. They don't. You know, we've done research on it, endless research on it. They don't. They would love the opportunity to go and get other forms of funding. They don't either don't understand it or the funders can't, can't offer it. And, and I think, you know, there is a level of, um, yes, it's fragmented, but we have to find a way to harmonize, certainly in the credit and lending space. Look at the payment space. The payment space is far better. The far, payment space, you know, it's probably a better, under, it was one of the, um, I think, from a fintech perspective, more original um, players. And I, I promise you, <laughs> I have tried to fit our product <laughs> into, the, into the payment space so we can leverage a payments license because it's a lot easier, but we can't um, at the moment. Um, but that is really missing for other products and other spaces. So I think, I actually think we would welcome regulation, but it, it, we need to find a way for it to be more harmonized in order to allow for globalization. Uh, thank you, Alexis. Uh, Sarah, would you like to add yeah. any cool? Yeah, no, and I think, you know, as a global law firm, we work a lot on globalization projects and, you know, it's a common, issue that people face and it's not just you know in the EU because obviously there's always going to be difference in regulation globally and so it's just trying to find the most sort of sensible way to be able to, to launch yourself and and people as you say I think we find a lot of clients they're willing to get licenses they just need to know what it is that they need and you know I think that's why people are quite excited for Mecar because crypto is very difficult for that you know do is it a security is it, what, what what is it what are we doing how can we have a method license it's not very clear and so i think that it's right that people want regulation i think you know they also want that to be balanced and there's obviously always talk about light touch regimes you know sandboxes how do you balance competition and innovation with protection um aims and you know, I think, Sue, you mentioned the FCA talking recently about becoming this innovative regulator and they they want to launch their new um, innovation pathways where they help provide sort of regulatory support for firms with innovative models. And they have a wider regulatory sandbox that's always open, not just sort of individual cohorts. And I think that's quite a positive thing, you know, getting that deep engagement between the sector and the regulator. Um, and I think, Alexis, you know, you mentioned it earlier as well, that having regulation that's guided by the industry and having discussions guided by the industry is, is really helpful. Um, I think also in the UK, the sort of post-Brexit discussion has been about moving to um, an outcomes-focused approach. So perhaps moving away from very detailed rulemaking, that we have a regulatory perimeter, but once you're in that perimeter, it's not so much about do you tick every single one of these boxes, it's how do we get the best outcomes for people and how do you ensure that outcome? Um, and so giving a bit of autonomy to firms, but sort of still ensuring that the outcomes are the same. Um, I think it has its pros and cons. It's actually, you know, some fintechs we've spoken to have said, that's actually harder. I'd rather have a set of rules that we can follow because then we know what's on the table. If it's outcomes focused, how do we know that we've got it wrong? Um, at the same time, I think that a lot of industries, you know, Alexis, you were saying you've done all this research, you know what the SMEs want. A lot of industries, a lot of other providers in different spaces think the same thing. You know, they they go out, they do research, they speak to consumers. Um, and so they think actually, you know, giving them this fact sheet won't help. What they need is, you know, X, Y, Z information from us. And so, yeah, I, hard to know what the answer is, but I think there's an interesting balance to be found um, between being able to be a bit flexible, uh, be a bit sort of open to discussion, whilst making sure that you're not sort of flooding the market with anything that's sort of dangerous for consumers or for, you know, the wider financial stability um, of, of Europe and the UK and sort of the world, basically. So, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting time, I think. Uh, yes, th thanks. This, this reminds me of something that I, I read uh, recently. Um, I mean, in the US, uh, the SEC, Securities and Exchange Commission was, I mean, they, they, they were being at least criticized that they've been doing more regulation by prosecution. So you find out when you've already been um, uh, infringing the law and then you're taken to the last bit of, um, and, and there were, I, I was reading in that article that there were some, I think, um, senators, House of Representatives, I'm not sure which ones who were saying that, no, I mean, the other side, uh, which I think Alexis also mentioned that, 
we need more um, ex, ex ante uh, regulation, more specification of the rules. I think this is this is something we are seeing, uh, and and me as a lawyer within EBA, we are seeing this. What is the right balance? And sometimes I, I, we discuss also with our with the competent authorities that participate in the work of the EBA, and uh, we sometimes warn them: Are you sure you want to clarify this to that extent? So there is there is this kind of balance uh, to to be uh, linked. I, I don't know whether Ruta, you would like to react to any of the comments already made, or uh, I, I can ask some more as, as, as you feel. No, it's okay. I really like the feedback and this, you know, interaction because uh, what we see and, uh, you know, uh, the one thing I want to address that Sarah mentioned about the sandbox and the regulators, supervisors to be closer to the industry, it's very important. And in a, EBA, EBA, we have this knowledge hub where we ask the companies, the innovative companies to come and to share the experience and share the business model, because it's very important for regulators to know what's happening, to know, you know, the practices. And especially if you are a policy uh, officer, you never done, for example, supervision, because during supervision, you usually can't touch a company, you can't do that. Uh, so this kind of interaction of relations is very important. I know that tomorrow, uh, European uh, Commission is launching a European uh, digital uh, hub, or uh, I don't know, this means maybe, you know, Finance platform. platform platform the way it try to you know to facilitate the, the fintechs to use some data and to innovate in this way they will promote the concept of european sandbox uh, so I, I think it's very important to find this unconventional ways to to uh, involve uh, regulators to understand the business uh, because usually we uh, we attend i guess it's uh, it's uh, changing that regulators tend to be like, you know, very conventional and don't uh, try to do everything by the rules, but this kind of um, real initiatives, it helps uh, to understand, it helps uh, regulation to be closer to the business. I was just going to say that I think it's really interesting because I think even five years ago, a lot of companies didn't want to speak to the regulator because there's an idea of that they were a danger, that that a bit like the SEC point, there was a danger that talking to the regulator means enforcement, it means them shutting down your model. And then actually, we're definitely seeing a lot of people want to get closer to the regulator. They're really keen to work with them and, and make those models work. And I think it's a real shift in how the regulators approach things, you know, across Europe and the UK, as well as sort of how, how firms feel about it. So it's, it's quite an interesting shift. I think that's true. I mean, coming from a fintech, I'd still say there's, there's a there's a fair share of fear still, um, but it, I think I think what there is the, there are all these official sandboxes. I mean, I'd love to know from Ruta, slightly from a selfish perspective, to be honest. But um, but you know, I think there's other ways of engaging. So um, so in the states, for example, there are all kinds of like lobbying forums and um, opportunities to speak to regulators in the various states. We're in, we're in the US as well, um, but in Europe it's more difficult and. Um, I, I guess I'd love to know if there were sort of other or plans to be other avenues and, and fora to have discussions and ability for stakeholders of fintechs to input into um, regulation and the regulatory strategy and, and business plans. You know, the thing is that associations, yeah, I guess being in an association, then you gather a lot of fintechs, it's a good uh, mean to, to contact regulators because then you see, okay, we have a representation of fintechs, we, we can uh, talk. It's, you know, it's very rare that regulators meet the um, a one company because it means you have to mean, uh, meet with all the companies because it's like level playing field in uh, putting that tension. Therefore, sometimes it might mean very bureaucratic because it is consultation phase, but uh, it's sometimes because of, you know, really managing expectation and being uh, really uh, just to everyone. Uh, like, you know, why this day, Alexis, why cannot uh, Sarah next day? Because, you know, why are you in this way? So sometimes when you put, uh, you know, in a place of regulators, 
it's a good way to understand why they act as they act, but sometimes it's not because they don't want to interact. Sometimes it's just you cannot be for everyone. So then we have to find the balance how to, to interact in a better form. And, and if I can add the the legal unit, ever legal unit input to that, we um we have other ways to to uh, assist participation. So we carry out also public hearings, but also our um, it, it is called banking stakeholder group, but it is uh, our stakeholders group, and there is uh, representation of the industry also in in there in our work. But uh, I I think that um, uh, what what Ruta says is a, is a reality that we of course need to function in the context of uh, delegated powers that have been given to us. I, I'm speaking for EBA, but uh, it's similarly for the UK authorities where I used to work and. And I know that there are limitations of this sort, uh, even in, in different, more flexible uh, systems. Um, I'm, I'm a bit cognizant of the time, so I'm, I'm, I had some more questions, um, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll let the floor to our, to our audience to see if there are any questions. But otherwise, I still have some uh, questions that I would like to pick up some things of, uh, of, of what the, the colleagues mentioned, all of you mentioned. Uh, would there be any questions from the public? Just uh, uh, raise a hand if we can see. I think maybe I think we maybe need the audience to put it in the Q and A or the chat, and we can pick it up. So maybe while they're thinking of questions, to Spina, for any questions, if you want to maybe ask a couple of extra questions you have, and we'll give time. For people to I, I, I think my, yeah. my plan was to I mean I ask this later but then uh, Ruta made, uh, made the, this point um, about different ways of uh, what regulators can do so I'm, I'm saying this from our, our point of view as regulators and uh, uh, Ruta I meant to ask you uh, to, to invite you rather to, to say a few words about reg tech and soup tech so how that side of the work so um, what are the opportunities for um, uh, the regulation to use technology itself, uh, so to innovate itself in offering its services to the colleagues, and and then maybe also uh, Sarah and Alexis can can say a few words because I think uh, it 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 opens up uh, opportunities also in that sense uh, for for the industry, so for compliance, etc. So I I know we've uh, been doing some work there, so maybe that's uh, uh, an opportunity for you to say a few words about this. Okay, so one of our, you know, mandates at the EBA Digital Finance uh, is to monitor innovation. And what we did last year, we monitor regulatory innovations, so RegTech, the innovations that we used to, to comply with regulation. So last year we issued a report, and what it's very important, you know, there is innovative products, but there is innovative ways is to comply with regulation and reduce the cost because with the regulation it comes uh, the compliance cost so we are working on that uh, last uh, like last year we issued a report now we are doing uh, different workshops for also regulators and industry to understand what kind of tools there are uh, in in relation to comply with regulation in innovative way another topic is subtech uh, like i said if you are uh, supervisor and supervisory fintechs. So you have to be fintech yourself. So supervisory innovation is talking about how you can supervise, you know, um, how you can have innovation and in supervision and uh, in a way that it would also facilitate your function. So uh, now we are currently issuing a survey among our uh, competent authorities to understand what kind of innovatory tools they are using. Uh, and just to share the experience by in the regulators and maybe use uh, one on another tool. So these tools could be even in AML, in consumer protection, it could be in resolutions, it, it could be uh, just naming prudential supervision. So we want to map and really engage regulation and supervisors in innovation, because if they use innovation, so they better for them to understand innovatory business. Uh, as well. I'm not sure whether Sarah or Alexis, you wanted to make any comment on that or? I think, I mean, what I would say is that every 
part of finance and fintech is embracing technology. Um, so it's a great thing that the regulators have a passion and an interest in it as well. Um, what I'd say is we see um, a huge amount of reg tech products come to market um, and suppliers come to market. We leverage and use reg tech products ourselves. Um, and it's clearly a space that is really at the forefront um, and evolving. Um, I also think that actually the ability for um, reg tech to develop and for regulators and banks to leverage reg tech solutions actually will help facilitate the whole harmonization piece as well. Because I think some of the innovations that they are making allow for that kind of speed, innovation, use of data. Um, so I actually think it will help um, uh, will help the regulators and, and the banks to, to kind of um, standardize processes and, and um, allow for that level of harmonization to a degree. And, and I think also Sue had a question. Yeah, I wanted to raise with the panelists. I, I I come here right. So fintech is fin and tech together. I'm a tech lawyer, um, that does fintech work. But I work with you know my team here at Baker's, which is full of lots of expertise on the reg side, like Sarah. I, I it, it strikes me that probably there's quite a lot of our audience are in the similar boat where they're not. You know they kind of potentially know enough to be slightly dangerous around regulatory issues and therefore need to work with their teams but i was going to ask you all do you have any top tips for people who kind of can see who are working in the space but they're not the kind of deep detailed experts around regulation are the do you have any recommendations of sort of you know materials or podcasts or articles you know kind of thought leaders they should follow just to the whole point of this session was really to try and help everybody understand what's going on in fintech and it's been a fantastic session for that but yeah it was any top tips about yeah for the more lay members of the audience around regulation do you have any top tips of how they keep up to speed on what's going on on your side of the fence so to speak i would say don't be afraid of your competitors so um i actually had a call the other day around options for european passporting and and going around europe with a competitor and um, and what's interesting is actually there's a huge benefit. We both we we agreed actually you know um, it was uh, so I run legal and compliance um, globally at, at Liberus and my counterpart um, at a at a competitor was was on the phone and and they had actually initiated the call because they said look we just can't get to grips with this what are you doing about it and um, and what we realized is look there are elements of the business that naturally are wary of each other more in the business development strategic partnership that kind of side. But actually, in the legal compliance regulatory side, we've got a huge amount to learn from one another and to, we're facing the same challenges. And actually, they will have experienced something and got some information that you won't have. And you similarly will have got some information and have some experiences that they wouldn't have had. So actually, I think there's a huge amount of benefit in clubbing together with your peers and see them as peers rather than competitors. Um, so actually, I mean, and that's something I learned quite recently um, in terms of um resources and podcasts and stuff um i think i think as lawyers we tend to like sign up to things like plc and practical law and legal this and lexis nexus and actually a hugely useful tool is to sign up to fintech business news so i personally sign up to not loads of them because you can get really overwhelmed and you're busy enough then you get thirty thousand newsletters which is terribly unhelpful but if they pick one and often ask your ceo or coo and or whoever i mean this is in-house but um or, you know your business leader and say what do you use to keep up to date now they'll have lots of things but pick one so i follow altfi which is fantastic and it talks lots about regulation all the time um so that would be my advice. Yeah, maybe maybe that's the use. It's the user friendly, as you say, sort of business focused journalistic approach. Yeah, much better. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And and also, I guess a plug is it, I did not feed this question to Alexis, but a feed. It's really a plug for SCL because the whole point of this network is we are you know the group for tech and law in the UK, and we're all about collaborating with you know other law firms, other stakeholders, other industry um, folks. So. Um, that's a great plug, but I think we have one question um, in the chat, Despina. So I'll hand back to you, and then maybe we can answer Federico's question, and then I think we'll uh, have a few minutes we'll left to wrap up. 
I, I, just to plug also the EBA side, because I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm from the opposite um, uh, direction from you. I'm a financial lawyer who the recent years have become, has become a, fin, uh, a fintech lawyer and, and got involved with SEL. So uh, just to say the, the EBA plug at least is that we also have a, a hub. I think maybe Ruta will, will say two words about this as well. Uh, so you could look also for resources at the EBA uh, website as well. And I'm noticing a, a question from Federica, who says, may I ask you for your views on the entry of big techs into the fin financial sector? Do you see more opportunities or risks for traditional banks, fintech companies and consumers? Thank you, Federica, for your question. I, I don't know who would like to um, take a first uh, shot at this. Ruta, maybe you unmuted yourself, so maybe you could. Um, yeah, I can start and uh, just um, following on what you said, you know, my advice just, I will say that sometimes for lawyers, I've been, you know, background a lawyer, it's good to have a lot of apps, different apps, and understand how the technology and new services works. Because what sometimes is a gap, then lawyers do not understand the practice. So this is the important uh, advice from my side. Another part, what I really, about the big techs, <laughs> you know, there is all the things, fintechs, big techs, banks, they have two sides, opportunities and risks. So at one point, it's a risk for banks who are not uh, flexible. And it's always what happened with the open finance, open banking. Then think tanks came, banks were reluctant, but at the same way, then it was implemented. Uh, banks used the benefit and acted as third party providers, like they interacted. So the, the big techs, I think there are both opportunities and risk. It's, um, I guess, doesn't depend on, on tech. It's if, if it's a big tech or it's an other um, company name or some other thing. It's uh, the way how they interact, how they provide services. And of course, on the one hand, for customers, it would be easier, easier. Um, uh, communication, uh, other products, but on the other hand, uh, also for banks and all players, opportunity to innovate, to to uh, to learn. Uh, so I think there is a two sides, not only black and white. Thank you for that, Ruth. I think because I'm again cognizant of the time, we have a little time left. Maybe I'll leave uh, the floor to Sarah to say a, a final comment and then um, try to wrap up. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, we see a lot of big techs looking for advice in this space. It's, it's a growing area they're interested in. They access a lot of data. They have a lot of customers. There's a potential actual consumer want for connecting those things together. And I think, as Rita said, it just comes back to the classic sort of risk and opportunity point. It, it's, you know, there's a huge opportunity there. There's risk to other players. There's risks to from a regulatory perspective and so um it's not something that's going to go away so it's just something that i think people need to manage i would say is my my takeaway on that thank you very much uh, sarah I, I, the time has passed but i mean this is a topic for which we could be talking for hours we had prepared also some potential uh, questions for um, uh, speaking about the future, uh, like we spoke, uh, you spoke earlier about the uh, crypto currencies, and of course now almost anything can be tokenized. Or uh, also Sue and yourself, you spoke about the plans of the UK to do NFTs again. Anything can be tokenized now. Or there is a metaverse. Anything can exist also in the metaverse. Um, and um, so everything is interconnected, and the, I'm, I'm sure we'll have chances of uh, following up perhaps with other events also with, via the SEL. Um, but with that, I, I wanted to, at least from my side, thank you for your participation and your, your comments and thank you to, to uh, the listeners. But I'll, I'll pass on to Sue to, to say the, the closing words for this event. Thank you all again. Thank you so much. No, absolutely. I think this is this is definitely a topic that we will be coming back to at the SEL across the platform generally, because as you say, there's just so much happening in the space. It's it's a really interesting time. And I, I spotted on our on our website at the moment, there is a the first in a two parter on the metaverse. If you want to see what um, someone's got to say about that, about that from one of our contributors. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Despina, for, for ably chairing today's session. There's so much to, to pack in. Thank you to Alexis, to Sarah, to Ruta. It's been really terrific to 
in, during this UK FinTech week to hear more from the lawyers, right, and the policymakers. There's often, it's great to hear from the industry, but often the legal um, commentators don't get quite so much um, of the time uh, during the, the, the busy week. Um, watch for the audience. Thank you again for joining us. Watch out for, for the rest of our events that we're going to be running this year. I'm very excited that our next event is quite likely to be in person. Um, not on Zoom, which will be a great novelty after two years of doing online meetings. So watch out, um, the details of that event will be um, circulated shortly. If you're not a member of SEL, do check out our website, SEL.org. Um, we'd love to extend our membership to anyone who's interested in technology and legal issues and the intersection. Um, and we have a range of, of resources and events there too. So um, thank you all for attending. I hope you all have a great afternoon. And yeah, we'll see where the future of FinTech takes us. No doubt, um, lots more change over the next few years, um, but uh, such an exciting area to work in. So thank you all. And thank you to Simon and Maddie for supporting our event Absolutely. as well. Absolutely. Thank you to the whole SCL team.